All right, Matt, I got to say, I'm a little worried um, because we're going to be talking about alternative based education. And you sent me a message. You're like, bro, I can't log on to the thing. Like, I can't log on to your. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. We're going to talk about schooling your kids at home or in an alternative way. And this guy can't even log into a simple website. Here we go. Again, that's that's so funny, dude. And yesterday I was I was helping some other Acton owners um, too. And actually, uh, guys that are friends with Tim, uh, as well, man. And we, the, the, between the three of us trying to get something done yesterday, it was the same thing, man. Like we couldn't figure out the technology to even have the conversation. So yeah, I may not be the poster child. I don't know. Yeah, man. It's all good. Like I, I, I completely understand. It's, it's interesting to me because we always think about the, the educated as being, the, like the rulers of the world, the people that are going to build the businesses, the people that are going to build, you know, everything, but it, it's, you know, outside of like lawyers and politicians, it's really not the educated. It's the wise. It's the people that have put some of this information into practice. It's the people that can actually do. Right. And so I differentiate, man, when I talk about this subject, I talk about the difference between being educated and being schooled. And we've confused those two things in our country where we think the people that have the most schooling or have done, you know, gone to the most prestigious school, that that equates to capability. Uh, And that's clearly not the case because it's what you said. It's the people that can actually do and, and produce results. Right. And that may have absolutely nothing to do with the actual school that they went to. But so here's the problem I have, though, or maybe not problem, but concern I have. Is when you look at the elite, we'll just use that term. Mm. You guys can define that how you mean. But what I mean is politicians, uh, the, the, the ruling class, if you will. Most of these individuals are schooled. I'm using Very your much. terms. Very right? much. They, so. They've gone to Harvard. They've gone to Ivy League yep. schools. They've yep. been indoctrinated into this, this ideology. Right. So how does a guy who's not, schooled like me. I mean, I, I went through K, K through 12 in a government yeah. school and that's, I use that term deliberately. Yep. And I went through about a half a semester of post-secondary education and realized I'm out. Mm-hmm. That's the extent of my formal schooling Good. education. I'm still being educated, but exactly. I also see it. I'm like, man, if I was a lawyer, if I was an attorney, if I was a, a doctor, if I was whatever, you know, would I be more influential within society? Would I be able to affect more change? Yeah, I I don't think that you would. And, and you mentioned the, you know, the quote unquote elite and, and that gives people the game, you know, we can go as far down the education rabbit hole as we want to go or the schooling rabbit hole. So what you're talking about with those politicians is the game of schooling. I can tell you this because of their network, because of their family lineage, They have access to opportunities, including getting into the Harvards, the Stanfords, the MITs, and they could have a 1.7 GPA and be on probation. They're still getting in, right? It's not the whole. This is that whole. um, I watched a documentary on 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 uh, Netflix or something, Amazon or something about about all these these elites and these Hollywood people getting their loser children into Ivy yeah. League schools on yeah. swimming scholarships right. when, you know, they've never been on any sports field in their entire lives. And dude, people think that's brand new stuff. That's the way it's always worked. Of course. There's always this level that has nothing to do with a meritocracy. So if you're wealthy, if you're connected, welcome to wherever you want to go. If you feel a need, welcome to wherever you want to go. And then there's different levels of the game every year too, right? You know, I mean, I was at Stanford University, right? And so we get down to various levels and we start going, okay, I need less white dudes. So it doesn't matter if the next most qualified individual is a white guy. He's not getting in that year because we got to fix our ratios, right? There's all these games to play. Okay, I got to Just to get into you. an indoctrination center, dude, not worth it. I got to stop you right there because yep. I, I hear what you're saying. And if you were to look at the political s- spectrum and you were find the middle ground, I'm, I'm to the right, not just mm-hmm. slightly like I'm far to the right, not extreme, yeah. but I'm, I'm pretty far sure. past the middle line. Sure. And so I hear when you say things like, Oh, this is the way it's always been. What, you know, it, it's, it's, this is how, how people I, I'm like, okay. And then, and then you're talking about, 
okay, we there, there's a white guy. We're not going to admit him yep. or enroll him. To me, as somebody who I think most of the guys understand, like I'm, I'm right of center. I, I think I hear that. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. But really, like, does that really yeah. happen? Like, tell me yes. about that. So let me, so let me reframe it. So, and thank you for making me clarify the word. So I shouldn't say it's always been that way because at the beginning of our, our institutions of higher education, it was not, it was not that way. Um, I will say over the last 30 ish years, it's slowly, uh, well now rapidly continue to go that way. And I used white guy as an example, probably a bad idea since you and I are two, uh, two bearded white guys that are, are more to the right of that line. It could just as easily be we need less Asian guys. And that was something that actually came into the news a couple of years ago, right? Where Harvard went, hey, we have too many Asians. And so we've got it. So the point being that college admittance itself is a game. And when I talk to parents all the time, I'm going, you know, I try to differentiate between school and education. Education is something that you should be taking on every day, all the time. It's inherent in what you do. If you're trying to grow in any area, you're going to have to educate yourself. School has a very particular game, and there's a lot of ways to play that game. That's the, that's the difference. But, but my question is, how blatant is it really? Like, is there a board of, of individuals sitting around saying, okay, we need to bring these many, this, this many students in this year, um, all right, we have 90% white or Asian uh, applicants. And so we're going to bring in at the yeah. risk of being misogynistic or even racist, we're going to bl- bring in these many uh, African Americans, we're going to bring in uh, this many females versus males, like, yeah. again, at the risk of being misogynistic, I-, I really am trying to get to the root of it. Is yeah. it that blatant where it's like, no, we have to hit these numbers? Yeah. And again, so we're talking higher ed. And so every one of these schools has their own game that they're playing. If you're going to, you know, small little Brevard college that's up the road for me, I I don't think they're playing that heavy of a game. But I can tell you when you start getting into your quote unquote elite schools, you know, I'm at Stanford University. I know for a fact we have 40,000 applications coming in every year. If we accept blanket, if we accept more than 5% of those applicants, we ruin our rankings in US News and World Report. What applicants? What applicants are you talking about? Any applicants that want to come in as an undergrad student. So you got 40,000 applications to stand. They want to come there, right? Got it, check. So so if there is a meritocracy there, whereas we say, all right, we're Stanford University. And if anybody meets this criteria, A, B, C, D, E, F, welcome to Stanford, right? That's how we're taught the game works do the right things and you're competing with other people. There's so many more layers to that. One of those being, we can only accept 5%. Even if 10% should be there, we can only accept five. And then you start doing those other layers of, well, they're Uber connected. They're Uber wealthy. We need a point guard. We need a cellist. Uh, we need, you know, a certain race race. We need a certain ratio of males, females, all of those things play in. So somebody who very much deserves to get in may not get in in a given year to a given school based on the given game being played at that school in that year. And it might look different the very next year, but that game- Because they're not black or they're not a woman or they're not based on some immutable characteristic. Correct. That has nothing to do with their performance going in. Okay. But let me, again, I'm going to come back and clarify because I really want to get to the root of this. I hear so many people and I'm trying to be as objective as possible. Sure. I hear so many people use the term they, right? Like Mm -hmm. they don't want this to happen. They are orchestrating this. They are blah, 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 blah. It's like, who is they? Like, is there a, is there a, is there a, like a, 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 a group of people yeah. making these who decisions? Like, who is they? Amorphous. Yeah. Who are these amorphous, right? And so, um, you know, when you get into uh, uh, the regents who, who kind of control um, admissions, right? And again, each school is a little different. And so you've got uh, donors at a certain level that are playing into um, some of these decisions that I've seen. And I'm just speaking from what I've seen, right? You've got specific sure. donors that... 
uh, are able to speak specifically into what some of this criteria needs to look like. And I wasn't at the top of that funnel making any of those decisions. I'm speaking more from the experience of not just having students that have faced backlash or gotten in when they shouldn't have gotten in, but from having uh, admissions records right in front of me and going, ooh, this student makes sense. And, and people being able to, and as I send it up the line, people go, no, we're going to, we got to take that one out. Or as um, I go, no way, this student's the no go. They go, uh, you don't know who her mom is. Yeah, that's going to keep going. Right. And I wasn't high, up, high enough up the food chain um, to see who's pulling the ultimate strings on that. Um, but and were I you know. high enough up the food chain to say, hey, this person, we ought to reconsider? It sounds like you're saying that you had some sort of influence over this. I had very clear, there were some very clear yeses and nos in my short time there. And I had very clear directives to change, or I had some things that I said, look, based on our criteria, that's a no. And I got word later, no, that's absolutely a yes because of who that is. Wow, man. That's... And so again, whoever's, you know, whoever is pulling the ultimate strings up there, um, you know, I, I don't know. And I'm speaking from my experience at one university I where right. I had that position, we get it. right? We get uh, it. But we get it. And again, it's like, it's, it's, I, I'm just trying to be more open. Again, I already said, like, I'm, I'm right of center. Everybody that listens to this podcast for any amount of time knows that, but I'm trying to see it. Like, okay, sure. is there really a quote unquote, they, is there really sure. some sort of grand scheme or strategy? Right. And well, based and on the people I've talked with, the answer is yes. And that's, and it's more, I think it's more readily obvious when you start looking at K through 12, right. And you start looking at the teachers unions that are truly pulling the strings, right. You don't your school boards and, and all that. They don't have the influence that, that everybody thinks the site administrator has no uh, you know, that the principal has no power there. The school board um, has a little bit, but the, the unions are the ones pulling the strings um, in most of these districts to make a lot of decisions there too. You see it more clearly there. But the question for me is always, why do you want to play that game in the first place? Like you said, you know, if you, if I see if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, yep, you bet. You have to legally, right? Well, actually you can become a lawyer without going to law school. Um, that's one thing that I learned from a lawyer uh, friend. Hold of mine. on. I want to talk. I want to, we'll get to that. I actually want to sure. revisit that because that's interesting. I want to revisit that. It is interesting, but like, if you want to be a doctor, yes, you've got to go, you've got to play that game. Right. I still don't believe that it's as effective if my son goes, man, I'm going to be a doctor. I know that's my path. I know that's where I'm going. Cool. He's got to go to, he's got to go to school. He's got to go to medical school. So if he knows that's his path, what are we doing making him spend two, three semesters, four semesters taking, you know, liberal, uh, liberal studies of Chinese ideology of 1800. Like there's so much superfluous <laughs> garbage that they've got to take still too, right? That has nothing to do with it, but it sure does cost a ton of money. Um, so there's still an element of a silly game that's being played, but for the majority of the people, and I asked a group of college professors this, uh, University of South Carolina, when I was speaking there, I said, what do people learn, do students learn when they come into your classroom that they cannot, absolutely cannot get anywhere else and probably for free? Like, it, can, they, if, can they YouTube your material? Can they read your material somewhere else? Are they going to be able to experience something that's going to teach them the same lessons? What, like, why do they have to take professor ryan mickler's class that's a bad example everybody and, knows and, why and they should a, take <laughs> professor mickler's I class i probably could have picked any other name uh, <laughs> it's like why do they have to take your class and none of them could give an answer they said and this is a room of of 80 80 to 100 people and they said they don't necessarily need our class but they need us to sign off on the material so they can get their diploma to me Actually, that's can give an answer story. to that yeah my answer to that and and i don't i don't know if i totally agree with this, but my answer, like if I'm being objective as possible is that, yeah, you could go to YouTube, but like, are you really going to do it? Oh the yeah. Majority of people. I don't, I don't think they are actually. Yeah. I agree with you. The majority of people aren't just like the majority of the people that sit there and take professor, whoever's class aren't going to actually apply things there. A lot of times anyways, 
right? Mm-hmm. They're going to play the game of school to get whatever grade they want to get to, to go on to the next thing, but they're not the majority. Some people go there very intentionally and they're, and they're better of off for it, right? And uh, they would have been fine even if they didn't go through some sort of government education or post-secondary bingo. formal education. Bingo, because what we're talking about- Like you and me. About, exactly. So who is the individual? Are they going to go get it themselves, right? That's the thing. And I was on, a, you remember Clubhouse? Remember the app Clubhouse? I don't even know if that's still even a thing. Yeah, it's like a uh, like a video thing or something. A bunch of people can get into like a chat room and then you can join That's that and hear yeah. like live conversation or chat, whatever. Right. Right. So I was in I was in a clubhouse thing probably like nine, 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 ten months ago uh, with a couple of friends of mine. We were in there with some CEOs, uh, CEO of Coors, uh, the beer drink. Like he was in there, CEO of Hobby Lobby. It was like this weird mishmash. And, I, and there was a business professor from Princeton. And um we started talking about education, started talking about the schools that I, that I run. He's like, yeah, I just think those, you know, that's, I don't think that's going to be effective. Um, and he started going down the parenting, the way I was talking about parenting He's like, ah, gosh, man, I'm just not sure that's the way to, to really raise kids. And I stopped him and I said, hold on a second, how many business, you're a, you're a business professor. How many businesses do you own? How many of you run? Zero. Mm-hmm. How many kids do you have? Zero. Right. And that's another big problem in academia is that we play a whole lot of theory in there and you're supposed to espouse this theory back. Who's actually applying those things. And that's like you said, you and I are the ones that are going out and and the people that are going out that are autodidacts that are going to go actually put in the work. They're the ones that are going to create the impact, whether they went to school or not. I've thought about this with my kids, somebody several weeks or months ago on Instagram, because I'm a big proponent of home-based education. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've typically used the term homeschooling. I I'm not going to use that term anymore. I'm going to call it home-based education for mm-hmm. some specific reasons. We can get to that if we want, but that's the term I'm going to use. Uh, and, and somebody had, you know, they always make snippy comments. They, right. They, again, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of these people make snippy comments about, you know, like, Oh, well, you know, your kids aren't going to be socialized. Your kids aren't going to be this, your kids aren't going to be that. <sighs> and I just said, you know, my four children are going to run circles around your kids. They're going to, they're going to be their bosses. They're going to be the business owners. They're going to be the managers and your children who are government-based education are going to have to report to my kids. Bingo. And you're not wrong. Um, my, my 11 year old and you, you know, I mean, you know, my kids. And so yes. Morgan, um, she said, I think it was about two years ago. Uh, and this was two years ago. She was nine. Brielle was seven and they had just purchased their first horses. They purchased their first horses based on the businesses that they are running, right? And they haven't been government school of the day in their life. They purchased those. And Morgan said something along the lines of, I'm glad there are still people that are kids our age that are going to go to college though, because if our business gets big enough, we're going to need to have people work for us. You're going to need to have lawyers and accountants. Yep. Yep. Spot on. Right. And you're absolutely right. We will run circles. And as much as that breaks my, heart for the, for, you know, the kids that are going to experience that government schooling throughout the reality is my kids are my responsibility. Your kids are your responsibility and want to make sure they have the best opportunity. And this is what's going to make the best opportunity. The whole socialization thing, dude, we need to destroy that right now. That's easy to destroy. We need to destroy that myth right now. Um, You know, you see it when when let's get into it. Let's talk about, because that's what, there's usually four or five, Matt, and you know this better than I do. Yes, sir. There's usually four or five, there's, there's an infinite number of arguments, but they fall into four or five categories. And one of them is socialization. That's a big one. Right. That's a huge one. So the whole concept is, well, how are you kids going to, going to be socialized if you, if you educate them at home? And so I like to turn that question back around to parents and say, okay, well, how, are your kids going to be socialized if they spend their entire day only with other people of their same date of manufacture, right? They're only dealing with people that are their exact same age. They're being taught to look down upon younger. They're being taught to automatically revere older. They're being taught that anybody that claims authority uh, is somebody they should be blindly obedient to, including ask permission to, you know, go and go to the bathroom. They're in a, in a system all day long, five days a week for 12, 14, 16, 18 years that does not transfer to any other system we have in society. But hold, let me pause. 
again, I'm trying to look at this as objectively as possible. Is that really true? Because mm. if you think about it for a second, there's always a hierarchy, right? There's so uh, let me just give you a little anecdote here and, and we can keep going. Yeah. But years ago, I went to, I think it was my oldest son's, I don't know, like, like house warming party or something. I, I don't know what they even called it, but it's like the pre like before school starts, like come meet the teacher, meet and greet, right. something like that. And so I went and I went into their classroom and I'm like, all right, I don't want to see how their classroom's organized. And there was a list of 10 rules. And the 10, and I thought the 10 rules were solid, like good rules, you know, yeah. civil rules, like all kids should need to know this. But at the same time, I was like, oh man, like this is what they're teaching them. And I'm, and I, and I screenshotted it. I made a post and a bunch of people were like, well, th- what's wrong with those rules? And as I looked at it objectively, I'm like, no, that's actually not wrong. Like those are good rules. It just rubbed me the wrong way. But then I thought, I thought about it. Like when my kids get into the real world, like there is going to be some of that hierarchy there that I think I would want them to know. For sure there is, but what's that hierarchy in the real world going to be based on? It's going to be based on competence. It's going to be based on how you treat other people. It's not going to be um, the way that everybody is divided in a, in a uh, traditional, what I call conveyor belt school system, where you're only with a specific group of predefined people. Where else does that happen? That happens in prison, right? White guys speak with white guys, black guys with black guys, right? You, you don't have gangs, a voice. Sure. Gangs, you've got your different <laughs> gangs, right? And so they've got to establish their hierarchy. And so then you want to show that you're dominant. So you, you know, you show dominance through physicality and you show dominance through manipulation and you show dominance there because that's also a way for your group to have a voice because the reality is the rest of the day, you don't have a voice. You're being told when to go somewhere, what to do, when to do it, all of those things. Again, very similar to how that looks in school, right? So yeah, there's always hierarchies, but a hierarchy that naturally develops because we are figuring out our tribe, figuring out if we're each part of this tribe, figuring out I'm the leader here because I'm competent here. You're the leader there because you're competent there. Um, you know, that's, that's a much different hierarchy. Um, I would argue than, than what you get in a, in a conveyor belt school system. Well, I had a really interesting conversation with two of my children yesterday. In fact, I was sitting there and I was washing some dishes. My wife and I had just made dinner together. We had made breakfast for dinner and I'm sitting there washing the dishes and outside of our kitchen window where the sink is, I can see my wife's garden in the, in, in the, in the backyard. And I saw my daughter in one of the garden boxes and her brother, my son had pushed her from what it looked like had pushed her into the garden box. Uh, so I, I hollered at him I'm like, Hey, both of you come up here. Yeah. And they both came up and, and I really, I'm, I'm trying to be more deliberate and intentional about this. So my oldest son, you know, he lied to me, right? Like he, he, he kind of manipulated the link, but he lied like sure. flat out. He lied. Cause I watched it. I was, saw the whole thing. Yep. And my, my daughter was being a wimp. <laughs> like both mm-hmm. existed. Both sides. Yep. All right. My son was being a bully. My daughter was being a wimp. And I, and I, and I talked to him. I said, look, you're both wrong. Son, you're wrong for being a bit of a bully mm-hmm. and daughter, you're wrong for being a bit of a wimp. And I couldn't help but think how this would happen in government schooling where the kid would be the the bro, the, the boy the brother would be suspended and and right. it would be make, making a big deal and we're talking about hierarchies and I'm like hold on like there's no nuance in any of this and that's very frustrating to me it's very frustrating and again it's not transferable because what you just gave an example of is how things can actually play out in, in the real world when there's context and you don't have context in a system that is designed to have everybody doing and saying the same thing at the same time on, again, that's why I call it kind of that conveyor belt schooling, right? And notice what we're, what we're talking about too. We're talking about socialization in terms of just habits and natural human behavior. We're not even mentioning any of the agenda kind of stuff that turns into being a a vast issue in our government schools, right? So again, 
what are you being socialized for? What are you being conditioned towards? What kind of mindset are you being, uh, you know, are you being given? That's a whole different conversation around that. So um, again, there's the nuance just gets lost because it, it has to, it's a, it's not an effective system if we allow for that nuance for our kids. Well, the conveyor belt doesn't allow for nuance. That's exactly right. It's, it's like, not oh, like, that's wrong. Pull that out, throw it away, restart. Bingo. Bingo. It's the cog in the wheel, right? And it's designed that way so that you, that's it. You can put the majority of people through as quickly as humanly possible. Let's, let's talk about this term that you just used, the agenda. Uh-huh. I've been openly critical about government schooling for about three to four years now. Mm-hmm. And I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this grand agenda versus a bunch of misguided individuals who I think probably got into schooling and education for the right reasons. Mm. Do you, like what? I'll just leave it there. Like what, like yeah. how many people have an, a quote unquote agenda versus yeah. how many people are just misguided in their approach to education? Yeah. So the, the, I think the mistake in the assumption on that is that there is a lot of individual choice or intellectual freedom for the majority of our educators, because there's not. I am fully with you. The majority of people get into this profession altruistically. They're phenomenal humans. And I've got nothing but, so I hope people hear this. I have nothing but love and respect for the good people who are teachers and administrators who are still in, in these government schools. Nothing but respect and love for them. And I was there, right? I was, I was with them. The problem is you are told what needs to be promoted. You are told what the curriculum is and you are to adhere to that curriculum. Otherwise you are risking your own job. You are to adhere to the ideology. Otherwise you are risking your job. So you've got a lot of teachers who are perpetuating things they don't want to perpetuate. And well, then you why have to do that because they they're, do that? because they're afraid to lose their job. You know how many teachers I talk to on a daily basis, teachers and administrators that are like, Oh, this is sucking my soul but I'm eight years away from retirement. I hear it all the time. And at the college level too, right? If I don't, if I don't tow the line tenure, if I don't tow the line. And so if I speak out against, you know, LBGT, whatever that, if I speak out against that, if I, if I'm in higher ed and I say intelligent design, not even God, if I just say intelligent design, I'm risking my career, I'm risking my tenure. And it's in the K through 12 system, right? They're setting up, um, you know, setting up uh, COVID uh, vaccination centers at certain schools where I was in, in California, and they're setting these up and teachers are having to ask their students certain questions and offer these things to them when they themselves don't, didn't want to do that. They didn't want to vaccinate their own kids. They didn't want to vaccinate. They didn't believe it, whether you do or don't, I don't care. But these teachers did not want to perpetuate that. But they were risking their career. They were risking, um, you know, getting on the naughty list if they didn't go along with the status quo. And that's the same as the curriculum continues to get introduced. If you're not on board, you are going to lose your position. And if that's their livelihood and that's all they've ever done, that scares a lot of people. I, I, I mean, have the experience of saying, well, F you, then I'm going to go do something else. I mean, I, I, but I don't pretend that everybody um, feels like they can, they can do that. And there's a lot of teachers that feel trapped. Yeah, but like, here's what I'm going to say. That makes you a horrible human being. If you don't pull, get out. Not get or out. You, or you go along with the agenda when you don't believe. Right, believe. like you're out of integrity. There's nothing lower than that. Nope, I agree. I agree. That, I mean, I agree. That's why you left. And again, I, I, I feel for them. Um, I get what they're saying, but I also, I'm with you um, at the end of the day, man, pull. And, and I say the same thing, honestly, to parents who see all this and won't pull their kids out. But right? wait, but you say pull, you're talking about kids or you're talking about teachers pulling? I'm talking about, I was talking about teachers first saying, I agree so, with you. But let's address that because everybody talks about, not everybody, but everybody has heard me talk about pulling your kids from homeschool. We'll get into it in a minute. Cause that's, yeah. or excuse me, pull your kids from government school. From government schools. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. 
I don't think I've ever had a conversation about teachers pulling. Yeah. So let, let, like, let's explore that for a minute. Sure. So I, I, I don't know what the exact percentage is. So somebody, if anybody's listening, can, they can go check this for themselves. But the number of, I remember talking to, uh, to a group of professors in California and it was somewhere near 50 ish percent of teachers, new teachers that got their credential, went into the classrooms in California, they were leaving the career altogether within three years, like 50% of new teachers within three years, leaving never to come back, right? Wow. Never to come back to profession. a mass exodus. 50% in three years is huge. In three years. And they never, I mean, that's all a lot of these people ever wanted to do, right? And they're, and they're pulling and they're leaving. So there are a good number of teachers who are like, hey, and the earlier usually they see it and they see the handcuffs that are placed on them and they see the ideologies that they're told to pass down. There are a good percentage who are like, nope, see you later. Uh, I'm out of here. Bye. You see it less with the people that have got, you know, have 23 years in, 24 years in. The state's going to fund my pension at 30, right? You see it less there. They're less, they're money. less apt money. Yep. That's it. There is the, the the threat of being uncomfortable when in all, you know, they'd always play the golden handcuffs. Is it's it is. A, that's exactly what it is, man. Yep. It's exactly what it is, but. All right. So, but let me, let me ask you this then let's, let's talk about educators in the government schooling system mm -hmm. because it's funny. Every time I introduce some of these concepts, people always say, well, Ryan, have you talked to any, like, I have family members who are edu government educators. I have friends who are, go I don't think any less of them. I love those people. Sure, of course. My family, they're my friends. Like they're exactly. people I talk with. I love those people. I think they went into yep. it for altruistic reasons. Like you said, yep. um, what, what do they do though? Like at some point it's, 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 it's a little disheartening to me that for the most part, does your wife work outside of the home or is she a stay at home mother? No, sir. She's here. And now that we're on That's this, what I thought. She's out here running the ranch. So that's, that's right. what I thought. Same, yeah. same with my wife, you yes, know, she, not the ranch, but the homestead. Cause we're not yes, quite sir. to ranch level yet, but she's the homestead. Yes. And, and I can't help, but feel for a, a mother or a father who's like, Hey, you know, like I want to work. I want to teach children. I want to be influential in their lives. I've joined mm -hmm. for altruistic reasons, yep. uh, but also we need two incomes. Yeah. What is it? What is a, a, a government educator like that do? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. And I hear that. Because you've been bit. there. Uh, I've very much been there. Um, so it was, we have to figure out how to, we had to figure out how to get out. We had to figure out what that looked like. And I, I went down um, kind of the, not knowing what I, you know, didn't know at that time. And I had a government, I was an administrator, right? So I was a government teacher first and I went, okay, well, this isn't about kids. I was what I called kind of creatively insubordinate. I was always getting in trouble for uh for doing what i thought that kid needed versus what i was told that they needed um and i got brought into a superintendent's office and the superintendent was like hey we got kind of a problem here like your site administrator is telling me you you know you're you're relatively insubordinate you won't teach what we're what is that your teacher or your your principal or your vice principal what is a yeah, site the, administrator yeah the principal um got the it. principal yeah it was like you know you're 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 not really following through on what on what she's asking you to do but our problem is all the other teachers love you. All the students love you. All the parents love you. And, and nobody would ever want to get rid of you. So you're putting us in a weird spot, right? So sorry. Yeah. So whoops, exactly. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and be a site administrator so that I can, so that I can pull the strings. Right. And so then I go get my credential and you start to see more of the same thing. This is about money. This is about politics. This is about perpetuating the system as it exists we're not talking about kids and we're sure as hell not talking about individualizing anything um, for these kids and putting any context on it, right? So I naively let go of my six-figure job there to go to a private school and make $31,000. First year, we had just had our first kid. So but how did you do that? Because from going from hundred plus thousand dollars yeah, and yeah. taking a six down at a minimum of 67% increase or decrease. Yep. Excuse me. Yep. It was, Come on, so like, how was, did you do that? Yeah, it was, uh, we're going to, we're going to cut down on our expenses and we're going to side hustle. So we moved, we moved to a place where there was, um, 
where you know the rent was a whole lot less. We got rid of one of our cars um, and I took on side hustle because we didn't want, you know, if we could make it work, I, we wanted Heather to be able to stay home. So I took on side hustle and started doing some teacher training things on the side too, which is what kind of ended up sparking the speaking career. So it was, you know, a maniacal amount of work on my side um, and some, you know, a couple of years of living really, really lean, man, to make sure it happened. And I knew I wasn't going to stay in that $30,000 you know, that was, we're going to do that for this year. And I'm going to start building out something else. You know, what were, more. what were some of your fears when you did that? Because I know there's going to be a lot of educators who are listening to that sure. or this right now. And they're like, well, you know, I, I would like to do that. It must be nice. It must be this and that, but like, what, oh what were some of the fears that, was, that, that was you horrible. experienced? And some that was of horrifying. No, it's not, it's not nice. It's not nice to go, Hey, hundred <laughs> K sorry, sweetie, 31 K. Yes. Our, our baby's brand new. Right. Like, did your gonna, wife go back to work at the time or were, you just buckled down? We just buckled down. We just Dang. got very, very intentional. So, what's the fear? The fear is that you're not going to be able to make it work financially. The fear is that I'm not going to figure out anything and I'm going to have to stay in this, you know, $30,000 a year job either more than one year or I'm going to have to go back into the public schools or I'm going to have to go into a different career altogether. Um, the fear is, you know, my wife's going to have to try to take something. I mean, it's all of those that or she's going to get pissed and just be like, you better figure something out or I'm, I'm out. out. I mean, there's all of those normal things. Right. Um, but we made a commitment. We're like, all right, let's buckle down for this year and I'm going to make something else happen. And so again, go, went into administration in the private area, which uh, in the, in the private arena, which um, you still make, vastly less than you do in the, in the public sector. Um, but that helped in the speaking in private. You do, you make less in private schooling than public schooling. Almost always, almost mm. always significantly less. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, started building out kind of these, these side businesses where ultimately it got to the point where I realized I love working with young people. I love working with the parents and the families and, and pouring into them and setting them on these great trajectories, but I am not going to be able to do it in this conveyor belt school system, so, which is ultimately why I left to build something different. And again, I make it sound like it was just a hop, skip and a jump. Right. Uh, there were five years at that private school too, which was when I started my speaking career as well, right? So by the time I got done with the private schools, I was doing 70 keynotes a year um, for Fortune 500. So I had made sure I had another income source altogether so that I could step away. How did you do that? I had. How did you do in. that? You said 70 keynotes. So let's say you did one. I mean, that'd have to be 1.1 1. Yep. 1 or 1. 1.2 a week. Yep. Yes, sir. So for, for five years, I averaged. So one year, I averaged 70. Um, the next four years, I averaged uh, like 40, it was like 45 a year. So still almost one a week and almost never in California. I was on a plane. Um, so I was doing that while I was building out the schools that I built. Uh, I'd, so I'd be on a plane, I'd go speak somewhere and I'd be on the phone all day talking to prospective families and I'd get home and I'd, Hey honey, how are you? High five. Hey kids, high five. And I was having breakfast with a stranger, lunch with a stranger, dinner with a stranger um, to build up our initial communities of the schools that we were building. So it was a maniacal uh, handful of years. My wife is a, is a rock star. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't have worked if she wasn't. Uh, correct. Absolutely. But, you know, it gets back to, you know, when we're saying, what did these educators do? They will tell you uh, there's not going to be any change that happens from within. I truly don't believe that. And if there is, it's going to be a very, very, very long tail game because there's so many levels of bureaucracy there. There's so much control top down from the teachers unions. Um, there's, there's just not going to be a lot of change that happens anytime soon. So that's why we just focused on, you know what, let's just build something better. Let's build something different. Uh, and then let's help parents understand that if they don't have access to whatever else we're building, that's different. Well, then let's show them how they can actually educate at a world-class level at home. Well, that leads into one of the other frustrations or concerns or one of the four or five things I hear people say, you know, when, when, when they talk about homeschooling and, and, and home-based education is this idea of they're going to get some sort of inferior education. Right. And it's not going to be as, 
or, or right. e- e- here, I guess uh, more broadly speaking, here's what I hear people say. You're not qualified not to teach qualified. your children the way that other school teachers or, or school teachers are. Right. And isn't that ironic that we go through a system of schooling as in we go through it as students and that system of schooling leaves us feeling inadequate and unqualified to then teach our own children. And so then what do we do? We turn around and we put them back in that same exact system that left us feeling unqualified to educate our own. Isn't that so why it is, it is. Right? I've heard you say that, but why? So, okay, cool. Why do we do that? Because we're attached to the ideology of, of what school is. School is a religion in this country. We grew up going to that. So even, even the term alternative education, right, is, is uh, culturally been hijacked to mean anything that's not conveyor belt school. I would argue well, it's that- It's weird. Alternative education, I hear it. I'm like, oh, those are the weirdos. Those are the weirdos. Because that's what we grew up thinking. Or the- like, or, oh, the or the- Or, or they're the about to go to juvenile hall. Right. Right. Exactly. Yep. That's what we were taught. Right. So we hear alternative and that's it. The reality is since the dawn of time, humans have always learned the same way. We learn by doing things. We learn by experience. We learn by working with a mentor, a master. We will learn as an apprentice. We learn by watching our own parents and we copy their behaviors. We learn in all of those different ways. And we've done it since the dawn of time. So then in the last 120 years, all of a sudden we make this compulsory conveyor belt schooling that nobody wanted when it was implemented, by the way. And we made it to, to funnel this vast you know, majority of the population. In. And so now, since we're a generation removed from when it got implemented, we all grew up going to it. So it's a religion for us where we think that is what being educated means. It is explain. Not- Explain to me when you said nobody wanted it. So my, yeah. my surface level understanding is that about the time of the industrial revolution, yep. we, we, we sent the men, we pulled them from the farms and we sent them into the factories, mm-hmm. right? And we said, Hey, work, work here. It's much more efficient. And we're going to pull you out of the family system. And mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know that that was like a deliberate, like get the men out of the house. I don't, I, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to go that far. And then, and then we said through consumerism, we said, hey, now, ladies, let's get you in the factories, too, because the men are at war and we need you in the factories. We need you to do the men's job because the men are out fighting and we'll go ahead and take care of your kids. Mm-hmm. That's a very surface level understanding of my my knowledge of government education. Can you backfill that a little bit for me? Yeah, I mean the you're you're not you're not entirely wrong, and I will always I will preface this too with anybody listening to this that wants to dive into this further. There's a man by the name of John Taylor Gatto, G A T T O, uh, was a brilliant human. Just passed away a couple of years ago, and I had the pleasure of, of meeting him before he did. Uh, and he was New York State Teacher of the Year, you know, in government schools for a couple of years. Right, he was in that that system for 30 plus years. And he is the foremost educational historian that this world has ever seen. And so he, in many of his books, which you can find free um, as PDFs, he can lay this out in more detail. But essentially, yes, this is a Prussian system of mass control. John wrote a book called Weapons of Mass Instruction. Deliberately? Uh, del- deliberately. Deliberately. So the men that were running the, you know, your, uh, your, uh, your Rockefellers and, and your Carnegie's and these guys that are running this at the time, that was exactly it. It's like, Hey man, we can, we can essentially make a, a, a nation of workers that are um, smart enough to follow directions for us and what we need to have done. Not so, you know, intelligent that they go uh, get something going. That's, that's a little better and start to question the status quo. Um, and, and we can bring mass compulsory schooling. John will lay it out way better than me. I read enough to go, oh man, um, I'm out. He has books or research papers on it? A ton. Yeah, Weapons of Mass Instruction is phenomenal. Uh, Secret History of Underground American Education or something like that. Uh, And Dumbing Us Down. Um, Three phenomenal books that anybody thinking about uh, educating at home should read. What was, so I got dumbing us down, weapons of mass instruction. What was the other Uh, one? And uh, secret, I think it's called the secret history. 
or underground history of American education or something like okay. that. Okay. Yep. All, all things you should read. And he goes into the history uh, much greater than I am. And as soon as compulsory, you know, uh, education was, or I should say compulsory schooling was introduced, it was met with a lot of backlash. The farmers that, you know, people, and it was first put in in like Massachusetts and they were like, oh, hell no, we don't want to do this. That's when the start, what, when did this start? This was in Massachusetts you're saying, but when did this yeah. start? Um, either late, late 1800s or early 1900s. And it was like, no, your kids have to go to school. Yep, exactly. And they're like, the hell they do. They need to be here with us on the farm and learning how to do things and becoming a, you know, I'm the neighborhood or the town blacksmith and, and, uh, and my boy's going to be the apprentice. He's going to take over that business, right? It's how we had always learned. Of course. Forever. What, so what I've noticed is there seems to be a trend, not just within the country, but also I would even say more so abroad. Cause I've talked to plenty of guys who are like, Oh, I would love to homeschool my kids, but I literally cannot. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what stayed that off here in, in yep. the States? Cause it is legal here in the States. So what, what yep. stayed that off here? Yeah. What stayed that off here? I don't yes. know. What, like, why aren't we like, I, I, I don't know right offhand. I'm not going to pretend I know, but like, I don't, is it, is it legal? Is homeschooling home-based based education legal in Australia? Or the UK? I don't think it is. Um, no, I think it's, I think it's legal in, I think it's legal in both of those. I know it's illegal in Germany. Um, and I, Canada, I, is it Canada? Uh, Canada. I think you still, I think you still I can. France. I don't think you can in France. Um, there are a few countries that have, that have eradicated it. Um, but I, I don't pretend to know what those are. I know that that's, I know obviously that's not the case here in, in this country. Each state has different laws um, around that that are pretty loosely monitored, um, which is- Yeah, because all we need to do in Maine, so so in Maine, my children can participate in extracurricular activities through the school uh, district. Yep. Not all states will allow that. Yep, right. Uh, and also, I think if I understand correctly, we need to report, uh, do an annual report on- you know, what they learned, the curriculum right. loosely, it's right. not, it doesn't need to be loosely. detailed, but like yeah, what we get that taught or yeah. something like that. And a lot of states are roughly about the same, right? And they, some states want you to take, you know, certain standardized tests, but usually with a caveat of just have the test results handy in case you're ever asked for it. Right. And most of the time you're never, no, I'm, not t I'm not having my children take any government test. Like, and so, and that's it. So it's like each state has a little bit of, uh, of a different, you know, thing that they're asking that they're asking for and want you to keep certain records, but at least it's still legal. Let's move into some solutions because a lot of people are like, they're nodding their head. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. You're beating a dead horse here. Got it. Check. What are you drinking by the way? What is that? That's coffee, man. I don't drink coffee. At all. You don't, huh? Zero coffee. Yeah. That's weird, I still, right? I still like you, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah. I wish, yeah. I'll tell you what. I've never done drugs. Never uh, never even had a sip of alcohol, believe it or not. Oh, I have. I have. And, I've uh, done plenty. See, there you go. Coffee's so coffee just not is, a thing for me. Coffee is my thing, man. <laughs> coffee is my vice. So I'll take it. So obviously I've been a big, a big champion and proponent of home-based education. We've been homeschooling yeah. our children for the past three plus years. Yeah. They're in summer, summer break right now. Uh, and you know, admittedly, I know not everybody's in the position to do it. I get it. Sure. I understand. Sure. I was in that position, yeah. not totally. now, but I was, what are some alternative methods to government schooling outside of home-based education? Sure. I mean, you've got a number of different um, private, you know, schools that are set up as either private schools or co-ops or educational resource centers. Um, and there are more and more coming up all the time. Now, obviously, um, if anybody knows anything about me, I'm, I'm partial to what Acton Academy is. That's why I left the schools that I was running to open these specifically, you know, and that is a global network, uh, of, uh, of entrepreneurs and parentpreneurs who are going, hey, we know we're not going to fix school as it is in the government, so we're going to we're going to band together to do something we think is vastly better 
Um, and so, and we're going to help each other in the process, you know, so we've got, um, you know, I've got three acting academies that I opened in particular. I've helped a number of entrepreneurs open these all over the world. And as a network, we're in 41 states and 26 countries. So, you know, I always tell parents, if you want to break out and actually create something that's a legacy for your kids and for the kids in your communities, for the young heroes there, that is an option because it's also an option that if you run it as a business and maybe you go in and guide, you can also replace income there, right? You can replace a teacher income. You can go over here, still educate kids, or you can uh, replace an income of leave this job over here and become the guide and the business owner over here. Uh, and you can build a nice, you know, a nice life and replace it that way and do something vastly better for your kids. So I'm, I'm a fan of the Acton network, but let me hold on before you move on, before yeah. you move on. Um, my kids like a te- a movie called it's with Eddie Murphy. It's called daddy daycare. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen it? Uh, I don't think I've seen, I'm very familiar it's, with it, but it's I don't actually know a pretty good, it's a pretty good movie. It's stupid. Okay. You know, it's a kid show yeah. or whatever, sure. but it's, it's pretty good. And essentially these two guys who've like lost their jobs or whatever, just yeah. through necessity, start a daycare yeah. and they're completely lost. They're completely ridiculous, yeah. but then they actually build a pretty good little daycare and everybody wants to get out know, of it. So, yeah. 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 It's a business, yeah. right? For sure. And, and so I made a post the other day. That was probably a couple months ago now. And I said, Hey, look, if I was, if I was a school teacher, like a government school teacher, yep. what I would do is I would leave the school district and I would start a school mm-hmm. and I would charge a thousand dollars a month mm-hmm. and I would pick up 10 to 20 kids yep. and I would make 10 to 20 grand a month. So I would triple double or triple my income for sure. Almost immediately. Overnight. I'd be able to create a curriculum that I knew worked. I'd be yep. able to have a little bit more flexibility on what I taught them. What is there, is there, are there laws in place that would keep me from doing something like that? You can. So each state's going to be a little different, but you can absolutely do that. You just got to know the game in your state, right? So if you're in California, let's say I was a teacher in California and I wanted to do that you have got a couple of different options. I can come out and I can start my own private school. So I could do Matt, you know, Matt Bodro's, Matt Bodro's school. Uh, And then I can enroll those kids and do exactly what you were saying, charge whatever I want to do, do exactly what you're saying. The caveats in California would be um, things like, you know, every year I would have to take vaccination records Um, of everybody there. And I would have to submit those to the state and I would have to enforce anything that the state ever uh, introduces. If they, if the state says, Hey, COVID vaccine mandated for any kids to go to public and private school, I would be on the hook. My license would be on the hook for imparting that upon everybody. Right. So you got to figure out, do I want to play that game? Right. So every state has its own game that you just have to figure out the rules of how to play. When we launched in California and Acton, we didn't do it as an official private school, partially to avoid some of that, some of that nonsense. What was it? So it was an educational resource center, whatever you want to call it, a homeschool co-op. Sure. I just said, whatever is essential just for the call, day. whatever you need to call That's it. what we are. Yes. We're a workplace for young people, like whatever you want to call it sounds good to me. Um, but we were also able to articulate to the state that we, California has a very specific definition of what a school is. They say, you know, that if you are doing things A, B, C, D, and E, you are likely a school and need to file as a private school. We could very clearly articulate that we didn't fit that as an Acton Academy. We're learner led. Um, you know, we, we don't fit this at all. So we're not a school. So we're just kind of a club and you can't really do anything about it. Um, so like when they came to shut us down in, you know, March of 2020, we were just like, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, So, but teachers can do that in each state. They absolutely could do that. Just play the rules of the, you know, whatever the rules of the game are in your state and create a a small pod like that. Um, And by the way, I was met with when I said that I would, parents could do that and help other parents. Right. Which is more of a co-op type situation. Sure. But you could do the exact same thing. Cause when I said that I was met with, well, nobody can afford a thousand dollars a month. I'm like, well, I can. Sure. And I guarantee there's 
20 people on that listen to this podcast. I guarantee there's 2000 people that listen to this podcast. Absolutely. That could, that could do that and would want to do that. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, if you would want to do that and you feel like you can't, Maybe take the example of a guy who dropped you know, his $100,000 a year job and went down to 31000 and you start cutting back because your kids matter that much where you're going to cut back and prioritize that. You know, I know that's a harsh reality too, but maybe you don't need the extra vehicle. Maybe you don't need that vehicle that costs you know, $800 a month and maybe you can go lease yeah. a Honda, you know, freaking What Civic. does it do without? Like right? I have, we have four cars. We have two drivers. We have four car. No, we have five, excuse me, we, not cars. But we have five roadworthy motor vehicles. I'll say it that way. Yep. Bingo. We don't need five. Exactly. We need two. We, right. we don't even need that. We need one actually. Exactly. So you make it happen. And the problem is we have in this religion of schooling, we've been culturally trained to think, oh, well, this should be free. I should be able to hand my kids off to somebody else for free. And so the thought of having to spend money rubs a lot of people the wrong way rather than looking at it differently and just going, man, how do I prioritize to make sure my, you know, my young hero gets the best that he or she needs. The thing that rubs me the wrong way is not that I have to spend money because we do, we don't necessarily acknowledge it taxes, for example. Sure. Uh, It's the fact that I'm paying money, but I'm not utilizing the services. Yeah, totally. Totally. And there's some, what are your thoughts about school vouchers or, or choice for schooling and that sort of thing? I mean, I think that would be a, I think that would be a phenomenal thing everywhere. Um, and I get, you know, some of the arguments against, uh, against that and we'll only good. What, what are the arguments against that? Uh, a lot of it just has to do with the, uh, you know, the theoretical equity of opportunity and saying, well, people in, um, you know, lower income areas. So what, so what, like ability to get to wherever, Mm -hmm. look, uh, look, Okay. All right. (laughs) People have been listening to this podcast enough to know that I'm about becoming a better man. Yep. And I believe that as a member of society, that I have a moral, legal, not even legal, just a moral and ethical responsibility to help those underprivileged. Right. Let's get that out of the way. Sure. But at the same time, why would I deny my own children opportunities because somebody else doesn't have that opportunity. That's crazy talk. That would make you a bad person. I mean, that's that would make me like, I'd be derelict of duty for as sure. a father if I did yep. that. Yep. It would make you a piece of garbage. hundred percent. Your kids should be your number one priority. Absolutely. And then move on to society. I agree hundred um, percent. So no school choice would be phenomenal um, across the board. Uh, having those, having the vouchers, you know, in some of those states that are doing, I think, uh, Nevada, um, if you, you know, pull, I think Arizona too, you can, you can have a certain amount of, or a certain percentage of your, uh, of your taxes as a homeowner can go towards uh, a private school of your choice. I think there are some states that are doing that mm-hmm. and doing it right. Um, and that's great. Yeah. yeah. And I think Nevada and Arizona are the two that come to mind, but I think it's a, a phenomenal thing. I know for a fact, Acton as well um, is working very hard as a network to drive the cost per student, not saying the t- how much tuition costs, but the cost per student to actually own and operate and run one, you know, trying to drive it down to somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars per student. Because per what? Per year? Per month? Per, student, what? per year. Per year. As far as the cost to educate. So then if you have a tuition that's 10 grand, right? 15 grand. Yeah. You're paying overhead, but you're still profiting enough to where we can start to set up scholarship funds and be able to go into, you know, our inner cities and help young people. And, and to okay. Help, so uh, what you're saying, that. when you, you talk about tuition versus cost per educating one student, you're talking yep. about, let, let's say I wanted to have my kid go to Acton. Yep. So I might pay hypothetically 15 grand, for example, yep. 10, 15 grand. Yep. But the cost per educating my child that year is only 1500. So right. 90% of my tuition would it's go good. towards yep. so paying it forward. That's exactly right. So you either go to, and some of it would go towards overhead, right? And so you got, you got to pay the people and you've got to pay, um, you know, a building space, but the beauty of the model, the learner led model is that you've got 50 students and 50 students. Once you have it dialed in, you really only need one 
maybe two adults. Maybe. Yeah, that sounds insane to me. I mean, you, t- you told it? me that in the past and I'm yeah. like, wait a second, hold up. Yeah. Hold up. I know. Well, again, because we've been trained like your good schools, you're going to have these small ratios, right? Of like one to one to 12, man, one to 15. That's what makes a good school. I argue that it's the other way. I argue that the more young people you could have per, you know, one adult, the better off you're doing, because what you're saying then is you've got systems in place and you've got a culture in place where these young people are wildly responsible for themselves they have learned early a lesson that you and I both know many people don't ever learn and that's sovereignty and personal responsibility. And they get it early and they're able to operate at a crazy high level without adult interaction and interference. But look, I'm, I'm not opposed to that idea. I just have concerns about that idea. What would those be? Real life Lord of the flies. That's that would be, yeah, I, I get it. For sure. Like, I don't want my kids like, yeah. okay. So we're talking about ratios. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason we pulled our children, our four children out of mm-hmm. schooling, let's just take one of them yeah. is that he would be in a classroom of 25 plus yep. students. Totally. Minimum. Totally. And now we have a ratio of four students to two adults. That's right. That's awesome. And I like that. Totally. And now you're talking about however many students to one adult. And so Mm -hmm. I have concerns about real life Lord of the Flies scenarios here. For sure. And this is where you get into the difference around the systems between an Acton Academy and and a traditional school. So that's not a day one scenario. One adult, 50 kids, all different ages. Let's see what happens, right? This is something that you work up to over time, you build a tribe, you build a tribe around character and values. So part of these systems, right? Character matters, treating people the right way matters. So they have contracts, all the students have contracts that they help develop and that they sign. And they understand that with those contracts, that means they can be, they're held accountable to that and they're held accountable by their peers. So if Ryan is acting like a jerk and he's going over and he's smacking Matt while Matt's trying to get his work done. He's going over and he's, he's smacking, you know, he's smacking Heather. He's going over and he's smacking Vivian. He's going, the other students can go, Hey man, contract says this, you're going to need to stop doing that. And there's systems in place where they can actually uh, like a judicial system. They can hold that guy accountable up to going, Hey man, you got to go. The kids can kick out another kid. If they show proof of, you know, he's, he's killing the tribe kind of deal. And you've got mixing of ages going on as well. So you're talking 50 kids and those 50 kids might range from five years old to 17, you know, 16, 17. And those 15, 16, 17 year olds have a massive amount of responsibility there too, including helping teaching and mentoring some of the young students, including maybe they're the chef on site too, and they're cooking the meals and they're getting the meals out every day, um, including maybe they're helping budget. Maybe they're opening the campus. Maybe they're answering phones. Maybe they're giving tours. Like they're taking on a massive amount of responsibility. What you're essentially creating is a small little community where everybody knows I'm responsible for some jobs here, including my own education. So you build this microcosm of actually, a, a you know, kind of how the world works, man. Um, it's a vastly different thing. When you do that, it's a different story. What would you, so act in a cat. So, all right, l- like let's, Let's scale back for a second. When we're talking about alternative ed- education, we have we have home based education, which is what yep. we do personally. Right. Yep. Uh, we have co ops, which would yes, be sir. like, and I think this is co ops is actually a good alternative for those who might have two parent two income households, yep. where maybe you can't go from two to one, but you can go from two to one and a half. Sure. Yeah. And so or, you enlist other people in the community or sure. Right? Or what you do, what I've helped a lot of uh, families and communities do, right. Is they've got, um, you know, five or six families that are relatively close and all want to do this. They all are, are, you know, everybody works, right. Mom and dad works in all five or six of these homes, but their schedules uh, mm. don't necessarily mm. overlap. Somebody's got Tuesday off. Somebody has Wednesday off. Somebody has Thursday off. Right. And they're able to rotate homes 
um, and each kind of take a responsibility for overseeing, right? And so then they come together on that. The hardest part on, on a co-op like that, because I think that's a brilliant idea. I think that's a wonderful way to do it. Um, the hardest part or the, the things that I've seen tear co-ops apart is that, well, the Bodros want to do it this specific way. The Micklers want to do it this specific way. The Lovells want to do it this specific way. And not everybody fully agrees on the way everybody wants to do it, right? So you got to get some cohesion right. to start. Um, but that's a great way to do it is a co-op like that. There's also the concern. There's the risk, you know, if, and, and I'm just going to use you as an example. I don't believe this for a second, but sure. if I send my children to you, there is a risk of abuse. Of course. Mental, emotional, physical, sexual. Again, I'm not putting that on you at all. I'm just using uh, that as an example. A hundred percent. And but so people will be like, well, what about that? Well, you have the same risk at government schooling. Oh, you got more, risk risk at got more risk at government schooling. You're choosing who to collaborate with in this scenario, right? I'm not advocating for, you know, just going down the phone book and picking every John, Dick and Sally, right. and just going, right. man, let's throw our kids together. Absolutely not. That wouldn't happen. But I'll tell you what, you get all those guys, um, you know, all those guys we went down to, to Mexico with and had all our kids together. Yeah. You're not concerned about that. In a heartbeat. Piece right. of cake. Right. Yeah. I'm not worried about it. So, yeah, we'd be conscientious about that. So you have co-ops, you have private, you have monastery. These are things. What, what is the mo monastery? Like, I'm not totally familiar with that system. What, what, what does that entail? Monastery. Uh, monastery is very similar to very similar to Acton Academy, as long as it is not and, and Acton can be, too, as long as it's not um, bastardized. A lot of people use the Montessori name and don't necessarily. I even said it wrong. I said Montessori, but it's Montessori. Oh, that's, all right. <laughs> so that's how yeah. little I know about it. So what is that's the all... Montessori system? Yeah. So that's based on Maria Montessori was uh, was the lady's name. And so that's very much a learner led methodology, too. So the, the basic premise there and it's phenomenal, especially on the younger ages. Um, the the whole idea is that. Children have very, very important work to do. They're going to learn through doing this work, that, which a lot of times is just play, but they'll call it jobs. And they're very big on setting up the environment for learning. So you'll have all of these games, you'll have all of these um, puzzles, you'll have all of these opportunities to you know, have animals on site, you'll have all these opportunities, but nothing is going to be forced um, you might have some station rotations and things like that, but you will have the choice um, to engage in this community and take on your as many jobs as you want to take on. Um, and then there's all the social, emotional and character um, kind of development there. So it's very much a learner led environment. Acton is very much that way, too. Just as they get older, they take on, I would say, arguably even more responsibility as well as starting businesses, um, you know, yeah, it's like on, on the voyage, right? <laughs> exactly, man. Internships, apprenticeships, um, all that kind of stuff too. But Montessori is great. What are your thoughts on pure apprenticeships? Like, for example, if I have, a, um, you know, one of my children, for example, is very interested in, you know, blacksmithing is of course the ancient yeah. apprenticeship we yeah. think of, but whether it's dentistry, yep. which actually dentistry, even though you do have to go through uh, dental school, Right. There is a lot of yes, apprenticeship sir. components to the dental, there, even medical there, community. There very much is. And kind of touching on something we, we kind of hit earlier. I don't know the ins and outs of how this works, but I was told by a friend of mine um, who is a lawyer in California that you can become a lawyer going through it more of an apprenticeship route and then taking the bar and not actually going to law school which I had no idea how that works. And I don't know if that's the case for all different types of law. I don't know, but I know that it reminds a, me if, um, fr what is it? Frank Abagnale, Abagnale or Abagnale. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, catch, catch me if, me you, if can. you can. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like he didn't go through a lot. I got to hear him speak. You did. So yeah. I think he passed the bar. Yeah. Without Brilliant. going through law school. Without going through law school. Totally. Yeah. So you can, apparently you can do that in an apprenticeship kind of model. I think personally, that is the way to go. Um, if, if you're able to do something like that as early as humanly possible, that's exactly what, that's exactly what you do. Um, I was just talking to one of our, our mentees from the Apogee Strong program earlier today, um, and he's 16, um, brilliant young man, and they're moving to uh, Florida. They're in Pennsylvania right now, moving to Florida. 
Um, and that's his whole, that's his whole goal is he's seeking out. We, we're working with him on a very specific way to um, try to contact and meet and go provide value to a number of people who are in his chosen field so that he can get a foot in the door with an apprenticeship and then just provide enough value to work his way into, um, into that field. It's wildly successful doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. And by the way, there's an organization called Praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, and it's discoverpraxis.com. And I don't have anything to do with them other than they uh, have become friends. Um, but uh, their entire post high school model is based on that. You do six months of a boot camp where you're learning transferable skills, blogging and copywriting and um, you know, creating a website and app development and just some things that are just general skills that can help a lot of people. And then you interview and you go work for somebody for six months full time. Mm -hmm. You get paid at least, you know, minimum wage, minimum or, wage or whatever. Sure. Yeah. It's like, I think it's like a $14 because they want it to be to where you come out of the program debt, debt free. So it's whatever the cost is of the program. You have to make at least that much, but it's like 14 bucks an hour minimum. Um, and you work for them for six months doing whatever it is they want them to do. And like 94% of those guys are rolling right into a full-time career. And I think average starting salary is like 52 grand. Then so are they, I got to ask, are they looking for employers to hire? Cause I'm actually interested in that. Yeah. A hundred percent. Uh, hmm. yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll partner with employers all the time. And that's part of kind of like, we're going to build out something semi-similar with Apogee and Apogee U. Um, and very much so. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I could hook you up with them. You'd get to interview a whole bunch of or you, I, whatever. I mean, I know you I've hired so two. I've hired two people from Braxis. That's awesome. They've been phenomenal. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm waiting for is I'm, I'm just waiting for like real life Hogwarts. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a nerd by any stretch yeah, of the imagination, but like yes. if I could go to Hogwarts, I would definitely go. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, dude. We talk, and I, you know, I'm the same as you, man. I don't even, I don't even know if I've read all the, I don't think I've read any. I haven't, of I haven't read any. I haven't read a word. Yeah. I haven't even cracked one of those books. Yeah. I think I got partway through something because I want to see what the hype was about through like first chapter. And I was like, dude, I just can't, not my, not my style, <laughs> but um, I love the concept of that. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we take when we're building out um, experiences and projects and things like that to give to either Acton Academy owners who are, are, are launching something for the students or homeschool families, you know, cause I get it all the time, which I'm sure you do too, is man, I'm going to homeschool, no idea how to do it. Where do I start? Um, and so we teach families how to build out projects like that where you're recreating you know part of your house it becomes hogwarts and your kids become harry potter for that it's amount so of time easy. they go take on these adventures right and in the process of them taking on these adventures they learn and they learn to a high degree and we can build a world-class education around things like that it's so easy i think parents often overlook it because we we place some government Edu the, ed the, the yes. educational program on a pedestal it doesn't belong Correct. and when i so a little anecdote when my wife and i started home-based education with our kids it was the first day and my wife came upstairs it was probably i don't know one two o'clock in the afternoon yeah and she's like hey we're done and i'm like oh cool you're gonna take like a lunch break or whatever a recess yeah, or whatever. yeah. yeah right she's like yeah she's, she's like, like no 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 we're done Right. And I was like, no, no, how could that be? And she's like, I don't know. Maybe we're doing it wrong. And I said, well, show me like, what did you guys do? And she showed me, I'm yeah. like, well, that looks like good. Like, I don't know. It's just amazing how efficient it is. And then there was one other example. And I think this happened either on day one, it was between day one and day five. Yeah. They went outside and we've got some property out here and mm -hmm. I'm up here doing my work. And they come back and I hear them because I can hear them downstairs. And I go downstairs and I'm like, hey, what you know, what are you, you guys are excited? What are you guys doing? And they had caught this frog yeah. and they had it like they had put it in a jar. It was out in the field or in the creek or whatever. And they they yeah. caught this frog and they put it in a jar. And I'm like, oh, sweet. So they showed it to me. I'm like, that's an awesome frog. Are you gonna name it? They're like, Dad, it isn't a frog. And they all started laughing amongst each other. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what's the joke? Like, what's yeah. funny? I don't, 
Like it's a frog. They're like, yeah. you're, you're such an idiot, dad. It's not a frog. It's a toad. It's a toad. And I, and I was like, <laughs> oh, awesome. okay, what's the difference uh, between a frog and a toad? And they're like, well, let us show you. And yeah. they had printed three or four pages on yeah. the distinct differences between toads and frogs. Yeah. And I was like, got it. This yep. is awesome. I get oh, it. Almost 100%. instantaneously, I got it. 100%. And the amount of, you're right. We like to add layers and it's a human, it's a, it's a default in the human condition where we think good things have to be overly complex, right? And world-class things have to be overly complex. Uh, and it's, it's not, it is not the case. Um, at all. Simplicity is uh, the mark of a, of a true genius, right? You can take something and you can simplify it down. Um, and that's so easy to do, man. And so John Taylor Gatto, um, again, I remember speaking with him and he said, you know, most young people could go from once they're ready for it, once their minds were ready um, for it, they could go from never having really done anything with numbers other than just whatever they're exposed to, you know, just in day-to-day -day life to wildly proficient in at least algebra. And they could do so in 50 to hundred hours total. Hmm. So a week, a week to two weeks, three total. weeks, maybe tops. Uh huh. Right. If you're doing, you know, however many hours sure. a day, right. right. So why are we spending theoretically years, right? It's a massive, there's a massive inefficiency um, that is taking place. And it's taking, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's to the detriment of our kids. And, and another, you know, it brings me back to another one of my mentors, uh, Seth, are you Seth Godin? You know, I know Seth, I know of yeah. Seth. I don't know him personally, but I know of Seth. So one of my favorite humans on the planet and, um, and really reading his, he's got a manifesto called stop stealing dreams. Um, that he wrote that's all all about education and i read it in the part i was a school administrator at a private school i was i had started to do all the keynotes i had learned about acting and i was like man i think i'm gonna go start my own thing but i'm not really sure and i sat and read his manifesto in the parking lot of the school and uh the very next day i came in and i was like hey guys i'm gonna finish out this year but then i'm gonna go build my own school i told the rest of my team i was like all right man i'm, I'm out um, that day I, that day and uh and i i got to tell you know, I've gotten to tell Seth that story, which was um, something that was, you know, one of my only bucket list things. Um, and he always brings back to the question. He did so in the manifesto and he did so in, in a number of our conversations. He says, you know, we just have to keep going back. What should education be for? What should it be for? And the reality is it's like raising kids, right? What do we do? What should it be for? We should be raising sovereign, free, independent character driven resilient human beings and if we're putting them in a system that is not building that we are doing them a disservice that's what education should be for and there's no better place to do it than you know i always tell people are like okay if you had to pick what is it i'm like it's either act in or home or, or home educate and i don't necessarily put one before the other um but in my mind those are your two best options, period, end of story. Well, brother, I appreciate it, man. Um, I think we're going to have to run this back. Anytime. I, I, there's, there's so many more. I, you saw it. I showed this. I held this up to you. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't come with any notes. And I've got notes. You can't maybe sure. you can see it. There you go. Notes. Yeah, yeah. Notes. I started another page right here. So I think we're going to have to run this back and do this again. Because this stuff's really important to me. This is very, very crucial for, for me and the mission of what we're doing here. So. It's absolutely yeah. crucial, man. Like you yeah. said, you know, if we, if we're on this mission to build better men, then why don't we start with the young among us? And that's men and women, right? Start with the young among us, make sure the foundation is strong. It's like, we want to skip over the foundation and just, you know, no, man, that's, that's where it starts. So couldn't agree more. Well, tell us how to connect with you, learn more about acting or you personally, what you're doing, what's the best way to connect? Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I'm probably most active on, on IG, you know, by my name. Um, but, you know, check out Apogee program on Instagram too. You can go to apogeestrong.com, uh, go to actonacademy.org, or if somebody wants to get a hold of me directly, just Matt at Apogee Strong is the best email. Glad to connect, glad to help. Right on, brother. Appreciate you. I appreciate our friendship. And I know <laughs> our kids are friends. And to see you, the, the joke between us is, you know, your, your daughter, I think, didn't want anything to do with 
playing catch or something like that. And then she meets my son and she's like, I'm playing catch, you know? And I'm like, I'm proud of that. And you're like, "Ah, I don't know if that's cool. (laughs) Absolutely, man. But I'll tell you what, if it's, uh, if she's going to have to start going, Hmm, boys are interesting. Um, I at least want it to be a solid young man. And then you definitely have a couple of them, man. So you got got three of them in fact. So yeah, man, the honor's mine. I appreciate it. Love you, brother. Um, Thanks for joining us. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about it.